It's a typical day in Oklahoma City. Children are in school. Everything feels good here, comfortable, safe. This is Sean Sellers' neighborhood, and this is the house where he lived. Bright, intelligent, athletic, handsome, clean cut. Sean looks like the all-American boy, your next door neighbor, the football captain, someone you'd like to have as a friend or date. But Sean is a killer, and he's on death row. What led to these tragic events? For many inmates, the answer is in their family background. Abused and unloved, they become filled with hate and then lash out at society. Not so with Sean. Although his parents' work did keep them away from home a lot, Sean knew they loved him. He didn't have a bad home life, but being on his own did cause him to become independent and a loner. I come home, fix myself something to eat, you know, watch TV, whatever, and I like being alone. I liked that solitude, I liked that responsibility that I had for myself, being independent. I never really had a lot of friends because I moved around so much, and by the time I'd really make a good friend, you know, uh, we'd move away, and that was got hard on me, so I, f I didn't make friends very easily. I liked being alone there as well. Learned how to play by myself and, you know, to keep myself happy and things like that. It seemed like I was always born to be a leader. Even when I was getting in trouble, I was always getting everyone else in trouble around me. and. Um, Everything that I always put my hand to always came out, you know, I always excelled at it, it always came out great, one way or another. Either it was, come, if I got in trouble, I got in trouble good, you know, or if I did it right, it was very, very right. Sean carried that independent spirit into junior and senior high school. I started playing football whenever I was in junior high, and I was good, you know, I was the best lineman on the team and stuff, and I set some high school speed records when I was still in junior high, and so, I really liked it, but I didn't like losing. I didn't, couldn't stand to lose, you know? And when I moved to Colorado, something was wrong with our team. We just couldn't get it together for some reason. We won our first two games, and we lost our last eight, and I never played football again. I was never with the in crowd. I, I, well, the in crowd to me is the uh, cheerleaders and the football players and stuff like that. In junior high, yeah, but after I got out of got into high school, I didn't want everything to do with football, so I didn't have anything to do with cheerleaders. I, uh, school was always easy for me. In fact, it was boring for me most of the time. And I would, uh, if I applied myself, you know, a little bit, I'd always make straight A's. But I figured, hey, I can relax and I can party and I can have fun and make A's and B's, so what's the use of studying? And that's what I did. Religion was never a big part of Sean's life, although he does have some Christian memories. One painful incident turned him against God. When I was 13, I went to Falls Creek, which is a Baptist, uh, youth camp here in, in Oklahoma. I uh, was having some problems with a, uh, a girlfriend, at the, my first girlfriend, you know, my first crush, you know, puppy love, all that stuff. I uh, was praying, Lord, just make her love me, you know, that's all I ask for. I'll be good if you make her love me. I was trying to make a deal with God. And whenever she broke up with me and told me that she didn't want to have anything to do with me, I blamed God. I got mad at God. Didn't have anything to do with Him. Every time I saw a church, you know, I'd think of her and it would hurt and I'd cry sometimes and I'd get mad. And so I began to really kind of hate God, lash out at him in anger. As he was growing up, Sean developed an interest in the occult. A babysitter checked out books on Satanism from the adult section of the library. As an impressionable 10-year-old, Sean was fascinated. There were some encyclopedia witchcraft or something like that. I remember some pictures out of it and a couple other books. Then. As I got 13, you know, I uh, got involved in Dungeons and & Dragons. And that was cool to me because it was like, yes, you can use your imagination, you know, take it to the limit. There are no limits. 
we got the kids together and stuff, and we started playing, and we played three different campaigns, which is really unusual for someone playing like that. But I was dungeon master in two of them, and then I played a tenth level fighter in the third one. And I liked that power, you know, that power of being in control. And um, Dungeons and Dragons led me into witchcraft, which led me into Satanism. Sean's interest in the occult grew, and soon he was reading everything he could find on witches, Satan, demons, voodoo, anything satanic. But more than just a game, Sean was intrigued by the mystery and the power. I met a girl, and she uh, introduced me to a witch. She heard this witch give this, a, a speech at her school, and uh, she knew that I was interested in the stuff, so she got her in touch with me. I said, what's the first thing I have to do? And he said, and she said, pray to Satan. And I thought, pray to the devil. Eh, <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, so it took me a few days to really get to where I wanted to uh, make that initial step. She told me how to do it. She told me how to set things up, you know. She gave me this incantation to say, you know, and everything. And when I did it, it was like something that I'd seen in all these movies that I was so interested in. It was an experience that I'll never forget. I laid down and I began to uh, pray to Satan as she told me to. I had to renounce God and pray to Satan, using Satan's name, and then use this, inc this special incantation she told me and use her, her satanic name, Glacione, to get through. And I did that. And the room got cold. I mean, cold, you know, like 10 degrees, 15 degrees, it just dropped. And I was thinking exorcist type stuff, you know. And I had my eyes closed and I was laying down. And I uh, began to feel this lifting sensation, like I'd felt when I'd sometimes use some relax relaxation techniques and stuff. So that didn't really surprise me. But this lifting sensation kind of just, it increased. It got to be more than it usually felt like, you know. And like I said, then the room got cold, and then it's like something reached out and touched me. You know, I mean, it was real, just like I'd reach out and touch you. These fingers, hands, something touched me. And um, I closed my eyes tight, you know, like, like, <laughs> you know. And um, these, they felt like ice cold claws. And that's real out of it, I know, but that's really what it felt like. And it was just like, touched me everywhere, all over my body, you know. And uh, then I heard an audible voice say, I love you. And I opened my eyes, you know, because I thought someone was in the room, and all I saw were spots, because I had my eyes closed so tightly. And uh, looking through the haze of the spots, there wasn't anyone in the room. And I could still feel these things. And so I closed my eyes again, and it was like, one by one, these things just disappeared. In Sean's words, he was hooked completely. He was obsessed with Satanism, and he introduced others to his obsession. Richard, who we've been friends since football and stuff in junior high, he began to see some differences in me and began to really kind of get an idea of what I was doing. And he came to me, you know, and was saying, Sean, it was on the phone, he said, Sean, if you're involved in what I think you're involved in, tell me, because I want to get involved too. And I said, no, you don't. <laughs> you know? And he said, no, really, I'm serious. And I said, well, come over, all right, you know. And he came over and I showed him some the Satanic Bible and some other things like that. And he was interested in it. From there, a lot of other people were around. I started looking around for people and um, people started getting involved, you know. And we had 13 people in Coven and we was doing rituals and things. After a while, that broke up. I was really avidly involved in it. And everyone else was kind of like, well, Let's try it out, okay? So I began doing rituals and stuff by myself, and uh, blood always played a big part in our rituals. We always drank blood, you know, and always shed each other's blood, cut each other, and do things like that. Then uh, I happened upon a book called the Necromonicron, and it's the Book of the Dead is what it's trans translated as. And it's about uh, basically worshiping the dead, and it's uh, a way of opening these certain portals into the realm of the unknown and the spirit world of the dead and stuff. And this was really, it became an infatuation with me. I was doing, I was avidly researching Satanism and stuff, uh, reading, memorizing my Satanic Bible, memorizing the Necromicron and stuff. We named our coven the Elimination, and our purpose was to get rid of Christianity, you know, to wipe it out. And I figured that wouldn't be hard, you know, because I thought that uh, 10 Christians, you know, equaled one Satanist. 
You know, I thought the Satanists, Satanists were all powerful and everything. And I had a lot of respect and a lot of fear from the people who knew me. By this time, Sean and Richard were deeply involved in their satanic rituals, but it wasn't a game or a fad. It was a way of life, and it led to this store and cold-blooded murder. So we decided that we had to prove our allegiance to Satan. And to do that, we had to break the Ten Commandments, one by one, all of them. And that would prove that we were totally against God and didn't want to have anything to do with God, didn't respect His laws, didn't respect His rules, didn't respect anything about Him, were completely and totally evil and completely and totally devoted to Satan. And we began to do that, one by one. The first few were easy. I mean, you know, you shall not commit adultery, no problem, you know. Uh, you shall not lie, or you shall not steal, you know. Those things, no problem whatsoever. And we broke all of them easily except for one, you shall not murder. And we decided, okay, the Satanic Bible has a chapter in it called On the Choice of a Human Sacrifice. And it says that you should choose people who by their actions basically beg to be killed, who contribute nothing to society, who can, uh, who won't be missed, who have no one, you know. And we picked a, ma a man that in our eyes fit this perfect description. He worked the midnight shift at a Circle K store. He had tattoos and stuff all up and down his arms. He looked like he'd been a speed freak or something, you know. He had just long hair, you know, kind of beard and stuff. Druggy, probably ex-biker or something like that. And we decided that was it. And we did a ritual one night and we started talking about it. And we decided, okay, let's do it, you know. Let's prove our allegiance to Satan. Let's break this last commandment. Let's get rid of this guy, you know. And we, uh, like I said, we did a ritual and then we invoked all of our time to Satan, you know. We devoted this thing to Satan. And we drove up there. And uh, I picked up the gun and I started to go in. And um, I couldn't do it, you know. I walked up the door and I, I went, turned right and I went around the side of the building first. And I sat there and I just got my, you know, just started really feeling a lot of hatred, just using my hatred and stuff. And um, went, took the gun, you know, and held it down and went back into the store, started walking into the store. And uh, Richard saw me come in and he was like over here and he uh, picked up something and said, you know, what, how much does this cost? Distracting him. The man, the man was drinking a cup of coffee and set the coffee down and looked up and I looked at him and picked the gun up like that and fired and I missed. It. Um, it went by his head and he jumped and looked at me and uh, he started holding his hands up and he started going, okay man, okay, okay, and he started moving towards the cash register. And I guess he realized that um, we didn't come there to rob him or something, you know, he knew us. And so something must have just snapped in his head. Richard and I traded places and he must have ran this way and saw Richard, thought it was me or just maybe saw him and just something, but he ran that way and he almost ran into me. And uh, when I fired the gun, he was only about a foot and a half, two feet away from me. And he'd hold, he was holding up some kind of a coat and was bent down. And um, when the bullet hit him, it knocked him down and blood splattered all over the wall. And I remember standing there looking at him and he didn't move. And I turned around, and Richard was leaning over the cash register. And I said, no, go. Let's go. And Richard took off out the door, and we got in the car, and we drove off. And I remember we laughed about it. We, uh, we thought it was so funny that this man, who had actually been stupid enough to trust us, who had been actually stupid enough not to even, you know, dream what was happening, what we'd intended, you know, was now dead. And uh, we were so proud of ourselves. And at that moment, we were not teenagers, okay? We were not human, so to speak. We had nothing, no emotions of, in, or of, of uh, kindness, mercy, 
love, all those things were completely gone. We laughed and giggled about this man's misfortune and we were filled with nothing but evil and hatred and anger. And so basically we went in there and we took nothing. We took no merchandise, we took no money, we took nothing except the innocent man's life for Satan. Because this killing was without apparent motive, the police had no suspects. Sean became intensely involved in Satan worship, riding in blood, invoking demons, drinking blood, performing rituals, taking drugs, and praying to Satan, all the while he was going to school and living at home. But his relationship with his parents continued to deteriorate. I didn't want to uh, hear no, you know, and I didn't want to be told what to do. I felt that this was my life. I could choose my friends, and especially my girlfriend, however I wanted to, and that she had no right to interfere began to have a lot of problems, really a lot of problems. And I finally just, it was like I began to have this dream. I was mad at him and I was doing destruction rituals on my parents. I tried to move out. They came and got me and said no, brought me back and stuff. I couldn't get, I couldn't escape the situation. And I began to do destruction rituals on them and I began to have a dream over and over again that I had killed them. And the best way I can describe it is one day I woke up and it was no longer a dream. An angry, confused, destructive young man went to bed in this room. Later his dream, his nightmare, would become a reality as he walked down this hall to his parents' bedroom. I woke up at night and I had my father's 44 revolver. And I picked it up and I had on the black underwear and stuff that I wore when I did my rituals. And I walked into their room And I remember just, I don't know how to explain it, but the emotions and stuff, the things that were going through my head were just completely hideous. Um, emotions full of hatred, anger, pure, pure evil. And if you've never, if you've never felt evil, I can't, you can't, there's no way that you can understand it. But I walked in the room and I, uh, took the 44 and pointed it at my father's head, and I squeezed the trigger. Then I immediately raised the gun, and to where I knew my mother was, I couldn't really see, but I knew where she was, and I fired again. And then she raised her head up, and I fired a third time, and her head fell. And then I walked out of the room, and I, uh, laid the gun down and I went and took a shower. And I remember that part of it very clearly because it woke me up. And I uh, walked back into the room and turned the light on. And I remember looking at my mom and blood was running everywhere. The smell of gunpowder was still in the air and there was a smell of blood. And I remember laughing and giggling hysterically like I did whenever we killed the guy at Circle K. I remember feeling like the weight of the entire world had just been picked up off my shoulders, like I was finally free from something. I walked out of the room, turned the light off, got dressed, and went to Richard's house. Today, Sean is inmate 156641 in this prison convicted of first-degree murder. But he's not the same confused young man living in Satan's nightmare. I'll let him explain what happened. I woke up in a jail cell, not knowing really what was going on, not really understanding what was happening. And a guy came by and said, yeah, dude, you're in here for murdering your parents. How come you killed them? And I just told him, leave me alone. I want to talk to him. And they came the next day and they said, you know, I hear they got you for another one, some convenience store clerk, you know? And I didn't want to hear that either. And so I was expecting them to come by and say, hey, I hear they got you for another one, because I didn't really know what was happening. A guy came to the cell next to me, and he said, you want something to read? And I said, yeah, you bet. I'd been there for two or three days, and I'd slept enough. And so uh, he gave me some science fiction novel, and uh, I turned it over to read the back of it, see what it was about and someone had written 666 on it, and I dropped it. And it was like, ah. And I didn't know, and then I kinda went, why did I do that, you know? And while I was still asking myself that question, he says, hey man, you want the Bible? 
I still don't know why I did this, but uh, because I had, uh, I mean, I had ripped Bibles apart. I, earlier I shared with you, oh yeah, I used to, you know, really confuse people with the Bible. I had burned Bibles, you know, I poured blood on them, I did all kinds of stuff. And yet when he said, hey man, you want the Bible? I said, yes. And he had someplace marked in it, someplace in Psalms. And I remember I opened it up and I read something, and I don't know, I have no, any idea what I read. I can't find it, but it's in there somewhere. I read it and it was like something just hit me. I realized that I was wrong. I realized that whenever I had done all these things against God, that God still loved me. That whenever I had uh, knelt an altar of Satan, you know, covered in blood, whenever I had cursed and cussed God, whenever I had done all these things, and I mean, I'd done some major things just to make God mad at me, you know, just to, because I hated God so much that God still loved me. And I had thought I'd been a Christian when I was 13, when I got baptized and stuff. And so my prayer was a real simple one. I got down on the floor, because I figured that was right. And I said, Lord, here I am again. If you'll take me back, I'll serve you. And I began to cry. I hadn't cried for a year and a half. I couldn't cry. My tears were gone. There was so much hate and stuff in my life that I had no compassion. I couldn't cry. I would tried to. I couldn't. But I began to cry. And I cried for about two hours and prayed and cried. And finally I fell asleep. And when I woke up, something was different. Didn't know what it was, but something was different. I had, I used to have this filthy mouth, you know, I mean, I, my quarantine says that he could cuss the wallpaper off a wall, and that's the way I was. But all of a sudden, cuss words tasted bad, you know, they'd, they'd stick in my mouth, they wouldn't, they wouldn't come out right. And there was something deep inside of me that I knew that all, everything was going to be all right. I didn't know what was happening, what was going to happen, but there was a peace within me that I'd never felt before. And um, that night, I had the first peaceful night's sleep that I'd had in a year and a half. I'd had been having these dreams, sick dreams of blood and, and sex and all this other stuff. And that night there were no dreams. There were just peaceful nights sleep. And so I knew there was a change. I knew that this was real. And this peace that I felt within me then, I realized that that was just what I'd been searching for all along. And I just couldn't believe that it was so simple. You know? It began here and ended here with a young man whose life has been destroyed as he destroyed the lives of others. Of course, Sean is to blame for his terrible crimes, and he accepts full responsibility. But he was carried on this tragic journey by Satan. Satan doesn't play games. You can't play games with Satan, you know? He takes everything seriously. And uh, you get involved as a game. You get involved just thinking that it's not gonna lead anywhere, and very soon you're gonna realize what you've done to your life because you're gonna be in over your head before you realize it. You know, Christians make me mad sometimes because they don't, pray, they don't study, they don't hardly do anything. Satanists get together and they spend hours, you know, praying to Satan, going against Christianity, declaring enemies, praying against specific Christians, you know. They know more about spiritual warfare than any Christian does. Sean has seen both sides. He's lived it. The hellish nightmare of the occult and now his new life in Christ. Forgiveness was something really hard for me. Whenever I began to really understand and realize that I was guilty, I wanted to die. I felt that, that would be right. I felt that that was the only way I could pay for the things that I'd done. And to forgive myself was a big step. It took a long time. And it finally came to the point where it was like God just said, hey, dude, you know, what is wrong with you? I forgave you. Who do you think you are that you can't forgive yourself? And so I kind of went, hmm, you know, that's different. But it wasn't easy. It was, was not easy for me. But I have forgiven myself and that's why I don't cry anymore when I talk about it, you know. It, like I said, it took a long time, but God's forgiveness came through. Where do you stand? I don't mean to imply that you are a Satanist, but where do you stand with Christ? Satan is not for you, and God is not against you. I don't think a person can ever reach their full potential outside of Jesus Christ. We are created with an empty spot within us, and God created us with this empty spot and a insatiable desire to fill it. And he did so so that we would seek and search him out. He's the only one that can fill that empty spot within us. Drugs don't do it, sex doesn't do it, you know, the occult doesn't do it, all these other things will not fill that empty spot. That's why you see people, you know, 
rock stars and stuff like that, you know, ODing on drugs, you know, you see people committing suicide who've got millions of dollars because they haven't got that spot within them filled. It's time that we really acknowledge what's going on out there. It's time we start doing something about it. And that means getting radical about Jesus Christ. And if you just give Jesus a fair chance in your life, you know, that's all you have to do. Just give Jesus a fair chance in your life and you can be the best you you can be. God doesn't want to change you into someone that you don't recognize when you look in the mirror. God wants to make you the best you you can be. And you can never reach your full potential outside of Jesus. Thank you.